Hey everyone, welcome back to the NPTE podcast. This is Will Crane, your host. Thank you so much for joining me as we go through the content you need in order to dominate on test day. So today I've got a practice question for you. This is related to the integumentary system, a little differential diagnosis for you. But before we get to that, just a quick thank you. Thank you for what you do. I know that as you're going through this process, it's tricky, it's tough. I just talked to someone earlier today who they had failed uh, whether well, on their third attempt, they had failed the previous two attempts with the exact same score in the 590s. Let me tell you, that, that's a frustrating place to be. And I, I talk about this in previous, I've talked about it numerous times in previous podcast episodes, but there's a lot of feels that go into this. All the, the emotional spectrum you feel, everything from sadness and grief to anger, denial. I mean, really, they do call it the stages of grief, but it, it, uh, it takes you through through all of those feels. And I guess the point is that it's not a linear process either, that you have good days and you have bad days. And the real trick is is seeing the why. Why is it that you're going through this full th- this whole process? Uh, obviously, a lot of you who are listening to this podcast, you know, you're headed into the exam for your first attempt, but that doesn't mean that you don't still have some pain and anguish as you go through the entire process. Uh, let me tell you, day in and day out, it is a daily grind trying to crack open the books, make sure you've jotted down your notes, doing doing all of the essential work you know you need to do, but making it happen day in and day out. And so let me just tell you and say it to you, thank you. Thank you for the effort you put into this. I know it will definitely be a blessing, not only to you, but to your family and your patients for many years to come, even generations to come, you could say. It's, it's a real game changer. And plus, I mean, also let's be honest, I just talked to another student who has been working as a PT assistant, which is good and noble, and has been working steadily through that, but waiting to pass the NPT for PTs. And this student is particularly looking forward to the pay raise that comes when they transition from PTA to PT. So all that to say that whether it be from student to clinician or really to any licensed professional, it's it's kind of exciting to see that change. And so I just want to say thanks. Thanks for what you do. So today we have a practice question. This is related to the integumentary system, differential diagnosis on exam day. There are not a ton of questions on integ, but there are a fair bit. So between eight and 11 scored items on the integ system. So clearly a larger of the smaller non-system, or not non-system, the other systems. And so definitely worth spending some time on. Today's question is all about differential diagnosis. And you can make an argument about examination, but mostly it's the evaluation process. And that's what we'll be talking about today with our INTEG question. So let's go ahead and dive right in here. Without further ado, as per our usual, I'll give you a moment to respond after I read the question, and then we'll talk about it together. Here we go. A patient reports painful cramping in the left lower extremity during walking activities that subsides with rest. Additionally, the patient appears to have left lower extremity pallor on leg elevation and ruber when dependent. Which of the following tests or measures will be most important when screening this patient for disease? So a patient reports painful cramping in the left lower extremity during walking activities that subsides with rest. Additionally, the patient appears to have left lower extremity pallor on leg elevation and ruber when dependent. Which of the following tests or measures will be most important when screening this patient for disease? One, ankle brachial index. Two, bioelectrical impedance. Three, skin fold testing. Four, volumetric measurement. So again, the answer options are one, ankle brachial index. Two, bioelectrical impedance three, skin fold testing, and four, volumetric measurement. All right, so this is essentially a two-step question. I I like to write two-step questions. A lot of times you'll see those on exam day. Two-step meaning you have to know one thing or infer one thing from the text of the question that then leads you to, okay, then I need to know what test or measure is best for that particular condition. So in this case, Let's do the first step. A patient reports painful cramping the left lower extremity during walking activities that subsides with rest. This is what's called intermittent claudication. Intermittent claudication, meaning that you have symptoms, uh, what usually a cramping system, that's what O'Sullivan describes as the most common report from patients. Uh, Painful cramping in the left lower extremity during walking activities that subsides with rest. Additionally, the patient appears to have left lower extremity pallor on leg elevation and ruber when dependent. So this is what's called the ruber of dependency. 
uh, it's related to, and th this is the first step, you have to relate not only the, the intermittent claudication, the cramping with walking that subsides with the rest, plus you have to combine that with the ruber of dependency where you have, they have pallor with elevation and ruber with dependency. That tells you this is most likely to be in some type of arterial insufficiency, uh, arterial insufficiency, I guess I should just, just leave it at that, arterial insufficiency. So then the next step is which of the following tests or measures is most important when screening for this disease? And so the one that is the clear winner here is the bio <clears throat> the ankle brachial index. <laughs> the uh, the correct answer here is that number one ankle brachial index. This is because the ABI is best at determining the difference between systolic blood pressure in the ankle as compared to the arm or the brachial blood pressure. So as you compare those, you're able to say to yourself, all right, if you have a decreased ankle blood pressure. That tells you you don't have very good blood supply or blood flow or blood pressure in the lower extremity, therefore indicating there is some type of insufficiency. And so that's what the arterial insufficiency is best measured. Usually you do it with some type of Doppler ultrasound so you get a, a very clear uh, very clear blood pressure reading. Obviously you can do it with a stethoscope. You can get kind of a rough reading with a stethoscope, but typically this is done with Doppler radar in order to get the best uh, best reference or best, uh, yeah, really just that, that best measurement of the patient's blood pressure in the lower extremity. So all that to say that ABI is your best bet when determining what the precise blood pressure is. And so that's why you'd use a Doppler ultrasound. Those of you who have done it before, uh, I've only ever done it in schooling. I've never had a clinic that had a Doppler ultrasound, but it, it's really handy. You're, you're able to, to actually detect when the the blood pressure really when you're able to detect the uh what is it when you detect the blood flow past the occlusion so past the sphygmomanometer you're able to detect it so anyway the abi is your best bet for measuring arterial insufficiency uh typically the values so you'll see some variance here on some of the precise values i the target though is 1.0 and i'll just tell you that that that's you want your blood pressure in your ankle to be the same as your arm so therefore the index or the ratio between the two should be close to 1.0. If instead it gets lower than 1.0, that starts to put you in the range of risk for, ar for arterial insufficiency. So O'Sullivan has listed the values. If you're down below 0.95, that puts you in the mild category. But once you get down below 0.75, then that tells you that you're in the moderate category. And then finally below 0.5, that's when you're in the severe category. Uh, also of note, you can have an exceptionally high ABI, so above 1.2. That's simply indicating that you have atherosclerosis and the blood vessels are not collapsing. You can't get a good read. So if you get an ABI that's exceptionally high, that probably also indicates that you have some type of arterial insufficiency related to atherosclerosis. So again, back to the moral of the story, 1.0 is your target because you want the same blood pressure in your ankle as you do in your arm. These other incorrect answer options, bioelectrical impedance, skinfold testing, and volumetric measurement, these are all helpful in diagnosing lymphedema. Now, lymphedema, that would be, you wouldn't get the ruber of dependency, that, that pallor when elevated and ruber when dependent. And you'd also not get the intermittent claudication as described in the question. Rather, for lymphedema, and we've talked about this in multiple other episodes, but lymphedema, when you have excessive fluid load related to poor uh, poor transmission of, of uh, the lymphatic fluid through the lymphatic ducts. Basically, the, the lymph system is the garbage collector. It picks up all the excess fluid, interstitial fluid, drops it back into the venous return system up near the heart. And so as you get greater and greater fluid load in the tissue, because if the lymph vessels are not working, then you'll have, a, uh, you'll have changes in the bioelectrical impedance. You'll have changes in skinfold testing because as you get induration and filling or a fullness of the skin, uh, additionally, you'll also have volumetric measurement changes. Uh, that's one of the key indicators of lymphedema is that steady increase in limb volume. So all that to say that the ankle brachial index, this is your key for for diagnosing, well, at least your clinical key for diagnosing uh, arterial insufficiency. Uh, clearly, there's more that can be done. Uh, again, you can you can actually, you know, get get additional ultrasonic visualization of the actual arteries. I mean, so there's certainly more that could be done there. But as far as your clinical measurement here, uh, the best bet is going to be uh, some type of Doppler ultrasound with 
uh, or checking for ankle brachial index. Also of note, you'll get, uh, uh, usually you see a loss of skin pliability. You get the, the increased pain, especially with activity, pain with elevation. Um, this is all with, with arterial insufficiency. Um, trying, oh yeah, and decreased tissue temperature and decreased, decreased pulse pressure. You'll have decreases in all that because you have arterial insufficiency. So you're not getting enough blood supply to the lower extremity. So these would all be additional tests and measures you could do in order to diagnose arterial insufficiency. And then just of note for the, the intervention strategy after you've diagnosed arterial insufficiency, uh, most of the time uh, as PTs were involved in the case of some type of arterial insufficiency ulceration. And so our intervention is typically going to be appropriate wound dressing. These wounds are, are quite commonly they quite commonly have very little exudate. They're quite dry. And so therefore we typically will choose some type of, of dressing that doesn't add, or sorry, <laughs> that doesn't dry out the wound too much. So as an example, you'd want something like an hydro a hydrocolloid or a hydrogel or an occlusive dressing of some kind, something that's moisture retentive because these arterial insufficiency ulcers tend to be quite dry, which is opposite that of of venous insufficiency ulcers, they tend to be quite moist. All right, so there you go. There's our question for today. Again, you got intermittent claudication with the rubber of dependency that leads you to say, all right, what are we gonna do next? Check the ABI that'll confirm your diagnosis of arterial insufficiency. All right, so with that, we've got some fun changes coming to PT final exam. The, I've got some, some uh, fun tricks up our sleeve coming up here for the fall season. So as you're listening to this, we're trying to get some some fun updates out and uh, you'll be the first to know here on the podcast. I'll be sure to let you know ASAP as soon as I have those ready to go. Uh, plus, if you're looking for a, a comprehensive resource to get you through the NPT, look no further than PT final exam. We have multiple products to get you through. A lot of people really enjoy our crash course. We do a, a three week crash course before every test day. This is our accelerated and super fun way to get through the test in a, a very timely manner. It is dedicated just to the big three systems, cardio, muscular, and neuro. If you need something more robust, we have two other products. We've got the independent study course, as well as the VIP course. If you, if you like live time and you wanna be in a class with me, be sure to check out the VIP class. Uh, otherwise, the independent study course is all the pre-recorded material you can take at your own pace. Again, a great way to study when you're on a budget and on the fly. You can check all of that out over at ptfinalexam.com. All right, we'll bring you to a conclusion. Thanks, everyone. Appreciate you all. Take good care of yourselves. Happy studying. We'll crane the fist pumps all around, and I'll catch you all in the next one. Have a great day.